Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing voltage-gated ion channels. Okay, right, so we're currently in the process of discussing voltage-gated potassium channels, and we're discussing how it is that once the voltage-gated potassium channel has actually opened, because there has been a depolarization in the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, how do potassium ions actually move through the voltage-gated potassium channel? Okay, and also, how does the voltage-gated potassium channel select for potassium ions over other types of ion that might be trying to get through? Okay, well, uh, we have studied the fact that potassium ions that are dissolved in solution are usually surrounded by water molecules. Okay, specifically, they're usually surrounded by eight water molecules that are interacting through these electrostatic interactions between the partial negative charge that is on the oxygen atom, okay, because of the fact that oxygen has a much higher electronegativity than the hydrogens in a water molecule, and the full positive charge on the potassium potassium ion. Okay, so we have these ion-dipole interactions here that are keeping uh, the uh, water molecules bound around the potassium ion. Okay, and these are called the hydration shell of the potassium ion. Okay, so we've discussed that uh, potassium ions with their full hydration shell can enter from the intracellular aspect of the pore. Okay, and in this internal portion of the pore, the portion that's lined by the S6 alpha helices, that portion is very wide, so the potassium ions can actually come in with their hydration shell of water molecules. Then, they come across the narrowest portion of the pore, the selectivity filter here. Okay, and this portion is the portion where the potassium ions have to give up their water molecules, okay, to actually go through that portion of the channel. Okay, and we've discussed now the structure of the selectivity filter, and we've discussed how the selectivity filter really consists of these four binding sites for potassium, where each one of these binding sites has a cube of um, electronegative oxygen atoms, basically, that surrounds it. Okay, so potassium ions can sit within these binding sites and then have eight electronegative oxygen atoms sitting around them, which is just like the hydration shell. Okay, so we've discussed that this is the way that we can get potassium ions to give up their hydration shell by basically replacing the water molecules with these electronegative oxygen atoms that are provided by the ascending P loops of the alpha subunits of the voltage-gated potassium channels, which line uh, the selectivity filter portion of the pore. Okay, and we discussed this conserved sequence of amino acids, threonine, valine, glycine, tyrosine, and then there is a glycine after that that's also conserved, that is found in absolutely every single alpha subunit of voltage-gated potassium channels, and it's always found in uh, this ascending portion of the p-loop. So basically, all voltage-gated potassium channels will have uh, this same sequence of amino acids lining their selectivity filter, okay, uh, and it will be providing these electronegative oxygen atoms to produce these uh, four uh, binding sites for potassium ions, basically. Okay, right, so armed with this knowledge, what I now want to discuss is the actual permeation mechanism. So how do potassium ions actually go through? So I want to completely spell that out for you. Okay, and then uh, what I want to talk about is how selectivity is achieved. So let's turn over the page and discuss the permeation mechanism then. So I'm going to show a very simple picture now of the selectivity filter. Okay, so rather than my big complicated picture that I have previously, the way I'm now going to show the selectivity filter is just as these four separate binding sites. So this is binding site number one on the extracellular aspect, binding site number two, binding site number three, and binding site number four on the intracellular aspect. And we've discussed that on the internal portion of the pore, that wide portion of the pore, then potassium can just come in with its hydration shell. Okay, so let's now see how a potassium ion can move through a voltage-gated potassium channel pore uh, once the voltage-gated potassium channel is open. Okay, so we'll be looking at potassium ions from the intracellular aspect going uh, through to the extracellular aspect because that's the uh, direction in which potassium ions will usually move when you open a voltage-gated potassium channel. Okay, so here 
we start off with my potassium ion here with its hydration shell of eight water molecules represented by those eight orange dots forming a cube around it. Okay, and this is going to come in to the intracellular aspect of the selectivity filter. So at the moment, it's coming in here to the intracellular aspect of the selectivity filter. Now, what's the first thing that happens then? The first thing that happens is it's going to give up its top uh, square of water molecules, and it's going to replace them by the bottom square of the selectivity filter. Okay, so it's going to replace them by these four electronegative oxygen atoms provided by the alcohol groups of the threonine uh, residues, basically. Okay, so let me just draw that. So this is picture number one here. Okay, now we're going to progress through to picture number two. Okay, so I'll draw out my selectivity filter again. Here are the four separate binding sites, like so. And now what we've got is our potassium ion here, okay, interacting with those four electronegative oxygen atoms of the bottom square of this selectivity filter uh, cage, if you like, okay, and then the potassium ion still has uh, its bottom square of water molecules lining it there. Okay, so now it's given up four water molecules and replaced them by those four oxygen atoms at the bottommost uh, square of the selectivity filter cage of um, electronegative atoms. Okay, right. The next step then for it is to move fully into this site now, into site number four down here. So it's going to now give up its uh, four remaining water molecules, and it's going to move into site four, and then it's going to be completely coordinated now by uh, the, cutes, the corners of uh, the cube of site four, basically. So it's going to have those eight electronegative oxygen atoms from the ascending P loops coordinating it. So if you like, it's going to be sitting here, basically. Okay, coordinated by this ring here and this ring here below. Okay, so it's still got eight electronegative oxygen atoms surrounding it, just like it had when it had its full hydration shell. Okay, right. So now picture number three, and we're going to have our potassium ion now sitting in site number four, basically. Okay, so here are our sites, and then we'll have our potassium ion sitting in site number four there. Okay, right, so what's going to happen now? How do you get the potassium ion to actually move through the sites? Because that's useless. It's now beautifully in site four, but why? what makes it move into site three, basically? Okay, well, what's going to make it move into site three is the arrival of another potassium ion. Okay, so here comes another potassium ion with its full hydration shell here. Okay, and it's going to come in now to the internal aspect of the selectivity filter. And as it comes closer, the positive charge on this potassium ion here is going to repel the positive charge on this one, and this one is then going to move into site number three here. It's going to move away from this potassium ion here, and meanwhile, this potassium ion here will bind to the bottom square of uh, the selectivity filter cage of electronegative atoms, basically. Okay, so it's going to do exactly what this one did here. It's going to give up its top square of water molecules and replace them with the bottommost square of electronegative oxygen atoms from those threonine R groups uh, of the selectivity filter cage of electronegative oxygen atoms. Okay, so what we're now going to have is picture number four here, and I will ring it just to keep with tradition. Okay, so here is our selectivity filter cage once again, our four binding sites. We've now got this first potassium ion in site number three here, and we've got this new potassium ion coming in here now, and it has now given up its top ring of water molecules, and it's now got this bottom ring of water molecules still intact. Okay, what's now going to happen is this one is going to move into site number four, and as it moves into site number four, it will repel this one again into site number two, basically. Okay, so now picture number five we'll have down here. Okay, so what we'll now have is if once again this is these four separate binding sites here, 
We've now got two potassium ions in our uh, selectivity filter, one in site number two and one in site number four. Okay, and they can't be too close to each other because of the fact that they repel each other through their positive charges. Okay, so they have to be separated by a single binding site, basically. So what's now going to happen, that again is perfectly stable, that could just sit there and sit there and sit there. So what's going to disturb it? Well, of course, another potassium ion is going to come along. Okay, so here comes another potassium ion with its full hydration shell of water molecules here. Okay, it will come in here and then of course it will do exactly what this one did to this first one. It will repel this one into site number three, okay, and that will repel this one into site number one. And then what you will end up with then is picture number six here. Okay, so again, here are these four different binding sites for potassium ions along the selectivity filter. Now what we have is potassium ion number one in site number one, potassium ion number two in site number three here, and potassium ion number three has now lost its top ring of water molecules by binding to that bottom square of electronegative uh, oxygen atoms uh, of the um, selectivity filter cage of electronegative atoms. Okay, right. Then what will happen is this one will move into uh, site number four here. That will cause this one to move into site number two. And this one will now have to move out. Okay, so what we'll now get is picture number seven here. And I'll draw this over here to avoid infringing on picture number three down there. Okay, so here are these four separate sites. Now we've got potassium ion number one in this position where it's still bound to the top ring of electronegative oxygen atoms provided by the carbonyl groups of those four tyrosine residues. And it's now got a new partial hydration shell. So it's now got four water molecules uh, making up a square at the top there. Okay, so it's half got its hydration shell back basically on the other side. Potassium ion number two is now in site number two, and potassium ion number three is down here. Okay, uh, and then finally what of course is going to happen is another potassium ion is going to come along. So now let's put in another one here on the intracellular aspect. Okay, so here comes a fourth potassium ion here with its full hydration shell. It will come in here, it'll repel this one, this third one from site number four into site number three. This one will then move in from site number two into site number one, and this one will be rebuked off. Okay, so now I'll draw the final picture that I'm going to do for this, okay, which is picture number eight. And what you've now got is here is the selectivity filter with its four separate binding sites here, and I'll just make sure this is in view, yep, okay. The first potassium ion has now been chucked completely off, okay, and it will now be on the extracellular side with a complete hydration shell reassembled. Okay, potassium ion number two is now in site number one, okay, it's moved from here to here. Potassium ion number three will now be in site number three, and here is potassium ion number four. Um, this has now lost its um, top ring of um, water molecules but still has its bottom ring and has replaced its top square of water molecules by the bottommost square of electronegative atoms uh, of the selectivity filter cage. Okay, and now basically this process can just go round and round, so we're now in an equivalent position to number six here, and it can just continue on and on and on basically, going round and round in a cycle. Okay, and this is how you move then potassium ions with a hydration shell from the intracellular side of the pore to the extracellular side of the pore here. Okay, right. So that now is the mechanism of permeation then of potassium ions through uh, a voltage-gated potassium ion uh, channel. Okay, right. Uh, so what I now want to talk about is the selectivity question. Why is this selective for potassium ions over other types of ion? Well, the first thing to say is that the selectivity filter, this narrowest portion of the pore, this is the portion that is actually responsible for selecting potassium ions over other types of iron. Other types of iron can come into the internal aspect of the pore of a voltage-gated potassium channel, but they can't get through the selectivity filter. Okay, so the first thing to say about the selectivity filter is it is 
the exact right size for a potassium ion. Okay, potassium ions are not too big to go through it, so there will be some ions that can't go through simply because they're too big. And the other crucial thing about it is that they're not too small. Okay, and that's really important. That is why sodium ions can't go through this. Sodium ions are too small. Now, let me explain why they're too small. Basically, these binding sites here that we've got, these four binding sites along the selectivity filter for potassium ions, are the perfect size for a potassium ion to sit there and have extremely good interactions with these eight corners, with these eight electronegative oxygen atoms, basically. Okay, whereas if you brought in a sodium ion here, okay, which is a much smaller ion, it's too small, basically. It can't have very good interactions with all eight of these electronegative oxygen atoms. Okay, so basically you can't get sodium ions uh, to give up their um, hydration shells of water molecules to bind to these binding sites. It's just not thermodynamically favorable. Potassium, because it can fit so snugly in here and have such good interactions with the eight corners of these binding sites, okay, uh, it will do this readily, basically. It will give up its water molecules and bind here readily, basically, because it can form such good interactions. So it's thermodynamically favorable for potassium ions to actually move in here and bind. Whereas for sodium ions, it's not thermodynamically favorable for them to give up their hydration shell. And I should say, sodium ions also have a hydration shell similar to potassium. It's not quite as big as potassium. I might just discuss this now because we'll need this later when we discuss discuss voltage-gated sodium channels. Sodium ions are smaller than potassium ions and can't actually coordinate eight water molecules around them. Instead, sodium ions end up coordinating six water molecules around them. Okay, one above, one below here, and I'll just add a bit of colour onto this picture. So here's our sodium ion. They end up with one above, one below, and then they end up with a ring of four around uh, the outside, basically. So you've got one at the back there, one at the side over here, one at the front, and there's your ring of four going round. And then you also have one above and below, basically, to create this sort of uh, diamond shape here, okay, around the sodium ion. Okay, and again, it will be the oxygen atoms of the water molecules that are facing into the sodium ions. Okay, right. So sodium-2 has a hydration shell when it's dissolved in water, okay? And basically, sodium cannot be tempted to remove its hydration shell in order to bind to these binding sites because it just doesn't bind to them that well because it's too small, basically, okay? So it's not favorable for sodium to give up its hydration shell to bind in these binding sites. And sodium with its hydration shell is too big to fit through this pore, okay? So therefore, or sodium ions can't really get through the selectivity filter at all well, okay? Whereas potassium ions can get through fantastically. So they're not too big and they're not too small. That's the crucial thing. Potassium ions are the perfect size to actually bind to these binding sites favorably enough that they can give up their water molecules to actually bind there. Okay, so that's the crucial thing that underlies selectivity for potassium in the selectivity filter of voltage-gated potassium channels. Okay, right. So that is now the question of permeation and selectivity dealt with, okay? In the next video, what we will turn our attention onto is the inactivation mechanisms of voltage-gated potassium channels, okay? So we'll talk about fast inactivation, also called N-type inactivation. We'll also briefly mention C-type inactivation, which is much less well understood than fast-type inactivation, and to be honest, isn't the main form of inactivation. Fast type is the main form. And then we'll move on to beta subunits, which are a way of conferring inactivation potential onto certain voltage-gated potassium channels which can't, under normal conditions, actually have fast type inactivation, okay, without the beta subunits, okay, and we'll talk about that in the next video.